struggle. What we're after is the control, the power, winning, being right. Many, many people, probably millions if not billions of people, get into arguments with people they love and they end up caring more about whether they win the argument than they care about the impact on the relationship in that moment. And so when we're in power struggle, um, we, we also lose our capacity to reason effectively because we're rationalizing the power struggle. Uh, I've, I've read stories about leaders in one country threatening to drop nuclear bombs on the country next door and we think, how can you imagine doing that? You'd kill everybody in your own country. But we would never expect someone who was alcoholic to be rational. No, none of us would believe the alcoholic who says, oh, I can have one drink tonight, it won't be a problem. Um, so if we imagine that what's happening to those world leaders or to us as parents with our children or us when we're in relationship in an intimate partnership or at work with coworkers or someone we're supervising, the same thing is happening. And there's information from Dr. Joseph Ledoux and others that the minute you get defensive and in power struggle, the complex problem solving part of the brain shuts down. So you are not able to think rationally. So you basically move into fight or flight, win or lose. And in that sense, power struggle is incredibly addictive. And every audience I speak to, I ask the two questions, how long does it take to get defensive? The answer is a nanosecond, although one person said, I don't even have to be there yet. I'm already thinking about what I'm gonna say to that person. Um, and the second question is, how many people on earth do you think get defensive? And the answer to that question is usually, unless someone names a spiritual leader that they believe is beyond defensiveness, um, the answer is that everybody gets defensive. So imagine what it means that approximately 100% of us on Earth can get defensive in a nanosecond, be in power struggle, lose our capacity to reason, and then function as if we're in an addiction where we care more about winning or losing than we do about compassion or relationships or what's happening in our families or our communities. Now that may sound extreme, and of course as parents we, um, we get over the power struggle and we go back and hug our kids and say I love you and we do work things out with our coworkers, but the impact is that it creates tremendously dysfunctional relationships. As a parent, and you want your daughter or son to go on the right track, then how is it that we would send them in the right direction without actually arguing or you know, having a disagreement. I mean, we can disagree, disagree, but someone of that age group that should know right from wrong, you know, and you still want to put them on the right path as a parent, mm -hmm. how do you take away from a power struggle when they're doing something that you know is in the wrong path, the wrong way? Mm -hmm. How would you actually send them in the right path, in the right direction? Well, what, uh, when I teach, um, the actual skill sets of powerful non-defensive communication, which is the name of the process I've developed. Um, I teach how to ask questions based on pure curiosity, how to give feedback in an observational way and be honest um, and say our conclusions about what we think is going on and our own reactions, but without trying to get the person to see that they should be different. Uh -huh. And then when I set clear boundaries with a, a child or a teenager, then I let them know clearly how I'm going to respond or what the consequence will be to certain choices, but I still don't try to control their choice. Right. Now, exceptions, of course, are if I have a two-year-old running out in the street and a car is coming, I right. go grab them. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but as I do those three steps, and I'm not trying to control the child, mm -hmm. most children will open up in a very, very different way. And when I work with parents, I have a set of parenting CDs um, that actually it's the... the, um, the that I do in a different order. When I teach adults, I teach how to ask questions, then how to make statements, then how to create boundaries. With parents, I teach how to create the boundaries first. Okay. And I teach doing that with both attitude and behavior. Okay. So mean what you say, say what you mean, and follow through with it is um, in the sense of as a parent, I guess in early childhood, that's what they said is you don't set unrealistic boundaries. But when you do say a consequence will be such and such, you actually have to follow through with that. Yes, and what I find is that many parents these days want to be more cooperative with their kids, so they try not to set boundaries. Well, let's all clear the table and you know, let's all work as a family and clean up the living room. And then when they don't get cooperation, they coax and when that doesn't work, they already have an underlying agenda. And so ultimately then they get angry and 
then they say, all right, now let's get in here and clean this up. So once they do set a limit, or even not really set a limit, just make a demand, then they've gone from coaxing and no limits to harshness. And what I like to see parents do is to say, if you come in and clean up the living room now, then it'll be time that you can turn on the TV or you can go and you know play with your other games or you can go ride your bicycle or whatever it is. If you don't clean up the living room, then I'm not willing to have you have other privileges until it's done. And so, and I have to be very neutral and have no other discussion after it, but I need to set that limit in a tone that's respectful and straightforward, but in, that conveys more of a gentleness, which often does not happen when parents finally do set the limits. And the limit setting always has the phrase, if then, in it. If you do this, then I'll do that. And I also set limits on attitude. So if I ask my child to go in and do the dishes and they go, ah, blah, 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 and they slam the dishes around and slam covered doors, you know, a lot of parents will just say, okay, at least they're doing the dishes. <laughs> and what I say is, I expect them to do the dishes with a respectful attitude. They don't have to tell me they're, you know, wildly happy about it. But I will say to the child, if you're willing to do the dishes with a respectful attitude, then you're welcome to do them now. If not, I'd like you to depending on the age, you know, have a time out, go to your room, not have other privileges until you're willing to let me know you can do the dishes with a respectful attitude. Now I'm dealing with consequences both for behavior and attitude and it makes absolutely a world of difference. It's actually like, let's talk about this. And then you're actually addressing it right then and there. Mm -hmm. and you're mm -hmm. discussing it with them. You're expressing mm -hmm. your feelings and then they can just kind of absorb it a little bit and just say, oh, Yes. I didn't really realize that I had mm -hmm. that impact mm -hmm. when yes. I was doing that. And when we talk that way, it really changes how we use authority. So I can speak to you as a peer whether you are five or whether you're 50. And if you like, I can give you an example. Yeah, that would be great. I went to the home of a family where the parents had recently gotten divorced. And the mom um, was concerned that her five-year-old son Daniel was not able to cry or show his feelings about how much he missed his dad because he wasn't seeing him as often. And the dad came from a background where he had the belief that boys shouldn't show their feelings or cry even at a pretty young age. So when I came in, um, I knew Daniel pretty well and he came and talked to me and then he sat on my lap and after a few minutes he said to me, Sharon, are you a crybaby? Now, in that moment, that's one of the places where as adults we might tend to want to help this child know that it's okay to cry, right? Lots of adults would now say, well, Daniel, it's really okay to cry. There's two problems with that. The first one is, I now become part of the loyalty conflict between the mother and the father. Because in essence, I'm taking sides with the mother and telling him he should show his feelings when he's already inhibited from crying, maybe in part because, because of his dad feeling that he shouldn't cry. The second problem is, Daniel didn't ask me if I thought it was okay to cry. He asked me if I was a crybaby. And so if I'm going to treat him as a peer in a conversation where I'm telling him my opinion, where I'm answering his questions, I believe I need to do it without acting superior or trying to advise him. So what I said to him is, I do cry and I don't think of myself as a crybaby. And he sat there and he looked for a moment. And then he sort of paused a little longer and he said, do you mean that if there's tears inside, they need to come out? And in that moment, when I didn't act superior, when I didn't advise this five-year-old child, he was able to take in his own profound lesson and to acknowledge both to himself and me that he did have tears inside and that he was beginning to see that they did need to come out, which then became his own choice. You know, I love what you have to say. It's so valuable to our viewers. And I also wanted to embellish a little bit about how to go from being defensive to non-defensive. Mm -hmm. Because that would be such a valuable lesson for our viewers if they get anything out of this, just to know yes. how to turn it around a little bit in their life. So um, I'll approach that two ways. One is, once you get defensive, I think it's really, really important to be able to move ourselves out of that defensive posture. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do, it's like being in a spell, yeah. you know. Um, but one of the questions I have found works very well for people is to start by saying,